a few lectures back, I introduced you to the idea that um, it wasn't just one part of the country or another that's economy was doing backflips. It really was every part of the country. And today what I want to emphasize is that every part of the country, every region, if you will, brought some unique aspect to the American economy that generally moved it forward. And that's where we're going to begin our conversation with respect to the middle part of the country that's typically referred to as the Great Plains. Um, before we do that, though, I want to introduce you to a, a guy by the name of Frederick Jackson Turner. He's from Chicago, and he will present this paper that is called the Frontier Thesis. In general, what he argues in this paper is that the West has always been the driving force of American history, right? It's what gets us up in the, uh, in the morning. It what, it's what pushes us forward. We've seen this from a very early standpoint. I mean, from the very earliest days of Jamestown, we've seen it. And, and we're presently seeing it here in the late 19th century. He also argues that the further West Americans go, the more American we become, we begin to shed, to rid ourselves of those old world identities, and we become more American. Now, the Great Plains is going to be settled really in the late 19th century. It's not going to be, even by the standards of the Far West that you'll see the next time we meet, it's not going to be California, which will boom very episodically. There's a reason for that. And the reason is, Kansas, Nebraska, what, what is now considered to be the breadbasket of the world, was once upon a time seen as the Great American Desert. If you've ever been to that part of the country, you can understand why. It's very arid. It doesn't get an enormous amount of rain. Um, it's flat. There's not a lot of trees. We're not talking about the Pacific Northwest or something like that. And it's also no coincidence, guys, that when Native Americans were rounded up in places like Georgia or South Carolina and forcibly relocated to reservations, many of those reservations were in places like Kansas and later on Oklahoma. The thought was this was not valuable arable farmland and therefore no self-respecting white man would ever want it. That will change, and it will change really for the same reasons that the economy, generally speaking, whether we're talking about New York, Chicago, or San Francisco, the economy was changing and it was the railroad that was changing it, okay? When you're talking about the Transcontinental Railroad, you're, you're not going to get from Chicago to San Francisco without going right through the middle there. And that is really what begins Americans to change their attitude when it comes to what those Great Plain territories would eventually become. One thing that I want you to understand here is that in, in the 1860s, the Railroad Acts um, granted huge, huge plots of land to the railroads to develop this entity. The railroad construction was not something that any one industry, any one industrialist was willing to take on on his own. It was very expensive and you weren't going to get your investment back very quickly. But it's also something that's very necessary. The government realizes this. So you think of it as an incentive to, to do this work. Huge, huge chunks of land was granted to the railroad companies. When that train is up and running and you've got, you know, locomotives going back and forth across the American continent, you've got certain parts of that land that you just don't need. Right? You don't need that, that, that part of Kansas. And so you sell it. And you sell it as cheaply as you, you want to because it wasn't yours to begin with. It was gifted to you. So it's 100% profit. And it's the railroads that really begin to, I guess you'd say, put lipstick on the pig that would be, you know, advertising. All of a sudden, what was once upon a time permanent Indian country now becomes the Garden of Eden. And everybody needs to rush out and take advantage of not only this valuable but cheap farmland. The government actually sees the potential in this as well. And in 1862, they, they pass a new law called the Homestead Act. And what the Homestead Act is going to do is it's going to give free land to anybody willing to go out into Kansas, into Nebraska, live on the land for, 
four years or more. You, you gotta you gotta physically occupy it. You also have to build a house on it. Now, if I can draw your attention to this guy right up here, this little sod dugout that he's sitting in front of, that would have more than qualified as a house by the standards of the Homestead Act. Keep in mind, we're not talking about Washington State here. There's not a lot of timber in that part of the country, so you're going to have to throw this house together and whatever you've got lying around, be that mud bricks or sod or sticks and stone, whatever, it would have qualified. The last provision is that you had to produce something. You can't just sit there. you got to grow wheat or corn or raise hogs or something. You've got to produce. And it's pretty simple to see where the government is going with this. What they want are those Midwestern farmers to go out there and produce an agrarian product to feed it back to Chicago to enhance the overall economy. And so the Homestead Act is very much a part of this, and you begin to see people from the East taking advantage of this, moving to the West to capitalize on basically free land. As a matter of fact, you see immigrants coming from all around Europe, but especially parts of Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and they begin to settle in what would become Minnesota um, as part of this Homestead uh, initiative in the 1860s and 70s. Um, you also see African Americans beginning to take advantage of this in the East, right? Um, it's no secret that in the aftermath of the Civil War, um, shall we say that there was a lot of unfinished business when it comes to full equality and freedom of that particular variety. Nicodemus, Kansas becomes this black enclave um, in Kansas, and it's a direct result of the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act didn't specify when it comes to race, as far as who would qualify, you just had to be a citizen. And so you do see African Americans that are looking at the West as this potentially untapped resource for freedom and equality in American life. And a good example of this is the small town of Nicodemus, Kansas. You also see the rise of the cattle industry. I had mentioned this a few lectures ago, but people didn't really go into cattle ranching for money before the 1870s, and then the reason why was it was really difficult to make a profit on this. It was difficult because these steer, like the guy that you're looking at there in the, on, the, on the screen, they were expensive to raise, and they didn't get a whole lot of money in the market. As a matter of fact, you'd only get about $4 per head. That all changed in 1877 with, you guessed it, the, the arrival of the railroad. The Missouri Central Railroad in 1877, it finally reached Fort Worth, and it made Fort Worth into what we call a cow town, right? It was the central location where people, where ranchers would drive their herds, not, not just cattle, you know, specifically, but other um, forms of livestock. Um, they, they would drive them into Fort Worth, they'd be put up on boxcars, and then we'd be shipped north to Chicago. Why Chicago? Well, Chicago is the meatpacking, meat processing capital of North America. That's where Jurgis Rudkus is going to turn it into steak and pork chops and bacon, and you get the idea, right? Anyway, all of a sudden, cattle ranching attracts an enormous amount of investment. And you begin to see parts of North Texas really explode because of this cattle ranching industry. Um, the price per head goes from 4 to $40, and not only are we attracting a lot of American investment, but a lot of foreign investment as well. So cattle ranching and um, the industry that is cattle uh, is really going to come into its own primarily when the railroad arrives, but it's something else that the central part of the United States is going to offer when it comes to this national economy. Now, I don't care if you're talking about homesteading, whether you're talking about uh, ranching, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me if we're just talking about railroads. This entire idea is predicated on the concept that nobody's living in that part of the country. And, of course, that's just simply not the case. We could go on for, for, for lectures, really, about the indigenous peoples of the central part of the United States, or what would become the United States. But the predominant group, certainly the group that has captured the attention of historians most directly, would be a group that we call the Sioux, right? The Sioux were an expanding empire, really, that 
we think began in central Minnesota, but by the time that the 1870s rolled around, had encompassed many parts of those central states. The Dakotas, Wyoming, um, parts of Montana, that part of the United States. And they were a nomadic people. And part of the reason that they, they were nomadic was because farming was pretty much unsustainable. I mean, you're not going to get the precipitation levels that you need to, to really make a go of it farming. So these are not people that are sedentary like the Cherokee were back in the East. These are people that are going to roam around. And they are going to really be the group that represents, and I don't mean this in a bad way, I mean this from the government's perspective, an obstacle. The Sioux are going to be a potential roadblock for what the government wants to see. And what the government wants to see are transcontinental railroads, and they want to see things like, you know, farmers that are producing for a national economy, ranchers that are sending beef up to Chicago, that sort of thing. And so we, being the federal government, tried to, tried to address this issue through a process that they came to call the reservation solution, okay? The idea is simple enough. The idea is round up Native Americans who are occupying parts of the country that you want and put them on reservations. Similar to what happened to the Cherokee um, in, in a process known as the Trail of Tears, um, they would be shoved into some corner of North America that white people didn't necessarily want, at least at the moment they didn't want. And originally the government had set aside what was called the Great Sioux Reservation for the Native Americans. Um, the, the, the Sioux Native Americans, that is. That's all fine and well. The, the, the railroad presented some challenges, which it, I guess you could say at least encroached upon Sioux territory. But the big, big problem is going to be when flakes of gold were found in the middle of the Black Hills in what is now South Dakota. Um, that was right squarely located in the Sioux Reservation, and not only was it within their boundaries, but the Sioux considered this to be sacred territory, uh, the land of their ancestors. And so not only were they going to be fiercely defensive, they're going to fight you to the last man. To its credit, the government is trying to stop this from happening, but they cannot stop these get-rich-quick prospectors from going out and trying to find gold on what was Sioux territory. So this is all coming to a head, right? And it's coming to a head uh, with a guy by the name of Wovoka, who's going to have this image that Native Americans, this visual, I guess you'd say, Native Americans needed to resist. Um, there's, there's an enormous amount of dancing that begins to emanate all around the plains that if uh, the, the Native Americans, not just the Sioux, but the Mandant and um, others that occupy that region, if they performed what they called the ghost dance, it would bring back the ancestors who would banish the white people from that territory. Well, that clearly captured the attention of the government who sends um, this guy right here. This is uh, Colonel George Armstrong Custer, veteran of the Civil War. They, they send Custer and the 7th Cavalry out uh, to the region to address the problem that was the Sioux. And this is going to come to a head in, 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 in 1877 in what comes to be known as the Battle of Little Bighorn. It's right there on the banks of the Little Bighorn Creek. And what Custer's going for here is the element of surprise. He, he comes across the Sioux, uh, a group of Sioux that are encamped there, and he wants to hit them before they know what's happening. So he cuts himself off from his communication lines, and he dives headfirst in. The only problem was he didn't realize that there were other bands that were kind of on the outskirts of where he was attacking, and those other bands of Sioux quickly close around him. They surround him, and every one of his men, right down to him himself, was killed, right? The 7th Cavalry was absolutely obliterated. It was a resounding victory for the Native Americans and a humiliating defeat for the, the, the American government. Now, 
you might think of somebody that does what Custer did as a bit arrogant, possibly even a little bit stupid. But back in Washington, they didn't call him any of those things. They called him a hero. He was a guy that was willing to pay the ultimate price for, you know, the preservation of freedom and democracy, whatever you want to call it. And so the disaster that was Little Bighorn essentially upped the ante for the federal government. And you see even more attempts to, to, to really address this issue of the reservation solution. Now, more and more military resources are being sent to the central states. And this is going to lead to not only conflict, but it's ultimately going to lead to a tragedy that we'll know as the Wounded Knee Massacre. The federal government had been increasingly militarizing that part of the country, and um, and this one particular occasion in 1890, they came across a band of Sioux that um, they, they told would, would that you would be okay as long as you gave up your weapons, you, you can camp along the, the banks of the Wounded Knee Creek. Well, we don't exactly know why, but sometime at the, during that, that morning, a shot rang out, confusion and panic set in, and by the end of this, there were dozens and dozens of Sioux people that lay dead on this battlefield that came to be known as the Wounded Knee Massacre. But there is very, very little regard for their lives as human beings. Um, old people were killed, women were killed, children were killed, sick people were killed, with very, very little consideration for the fact that at the end of the day, these were human beings. It's a very bitter episode in, in our history because ultimately it, it raises this conversation that Americans were, were not exactly comfortable in having. What I like to call the G and C words. Uh, uh, C being colonization, because essentially that's what's happening to that part of the country is the American government is colonizing it, and genocide. Now, I don't mean genocide like World War II Holocaust genocide, but you do see people that are killed basically because they're seen as this obstacle for in, in, in the name of progress. And the Wounded Knee Massacre is a good example of that in a very bad way, right? Now, this all being said, you would think that the government had made its point and, uh, you know, they had won the war, so to speak, but uh, the, 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 the Wovoka's vision of this ghost dance really sent shockwaves of terror through the government that felt that they needed to push that envelope a little bit further. What they begin doing in the aftermath of, um, um, of Little Bighorn is they begin setting up these schools. And these schools are designed to teach writing and arithmetic and all that fun stuff, but they're also designed to acculturate and assimilate Native Americans into the broader Anglo culture. If you're looking at the screen there, you're looking at some of the images of these schools. And as you'll note, those indigenous people are all dressed basically like white people. Um, their hairstyles and some of the jewelry that they're wearing, those are very Anglo-styled features. Um, you've heard of the expression, get them while they're young. What these schools were emphasizing was to farm like white people and to hunt and fish like white people and to think of themselves as American citizens. It was what I think of as cultural assassination. And it didn't even stop with the schools. In 1887, Congress issued a law that came to be known as the Dawes Act one of the ugliest, nastiest, most racist laws in all of American history, but it boils down to two really important points. One, what the Dawes Act is going to do is it's going to give the President of the United States permission to um, buy Native American territories. Now, I'm using air quotes primarily because the, the, the Natives that sold their land never saw a dime of it. Um, but assuming for a minute that you didn't want to sell um, you wouldn't have a choice. The president had that authority, like it or not. But they said that they would be reasonable, that the government would make exceptions. The other part of the Dawes Act that I need you to be mindful of is it said that if you didn't want to sell your land, you could keep it as long as you gave up your culture. 
as long as you abandon tribal culture and learn to live like a white person, you could hold on to your land forever and ever and ever. Again, a very good, in a bad way, example of cultural assassination. It's pretty clear what they're trying to do. What the government's trying to do is race, completely stamp out any memory of resistance in the context of these Indian wars of the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. And part of that very much involves undermining tribal culture and getting Native people to think of themselves as American citizens and uh, not Native peoples. Even sympathizers like Helen Hunt Jackson, who wrote this really important piece called A Century of Dishonor, blasted the federal government, called it genocide in various forms and fashions, but at the end of the day said the time had come for the natives to walk on the white man's road. As I said before, it's a very bitter part of our history, but this is how we come to basically inhabit that part of the United States. And keep in mind that part of the United States is very, very important for the development of this national economy. The next time we meet, I'm going to be going through the development of the Far West, and you're going to see um, not only will that contribute to a national economy, but similar to the central part of the United States, it was predicated on the idea that nobody was living there. And of course, that's not the case. So we'll pick it up there next time.